Detroit says the sky is falling. The U.S. dropped by almost half. We're nowhere near where we should be in car sales. An unimaginable two billion bucks a month. Their last line of defense is being used. We're not going to put a target in terms of when we can return to profit. No, no. Americans, no. We're not, we're not, we're Americans are through buying second. cars right now. Cover at multi-decade lows. I have trouble hearing when people say, it's much like Michael said, uh, when people tell you that something's improbable, uh, it is likely that that may be something you want to take a closer look at. So uh, um, I'd like to tell you my story. I promised you that I would, and I'm here to share it with everybody else. So it starts 10 years ago in 1999 when I joined the US Marines. Uh, I was an infantryman, and I was dropped into a war zone for the first time in my life. It's an experience that some of us here share, and some of us uh, certainly have read a lot about. And I befriended a Shia Arab. His name was Safa. And Safa worked at the camp where I lived and patrolled out of. And I spent my days going out and patrolling the streets to get rid of bomb-riddled uh, IED uh, um, boxes that would sit quietly on the side of the road. And Safa spent his day working in our camp. And uh, one day when Safa was coming to work, he was pulled over on the side of the road in his Chevy Caprice. And the three coworkers that he was with were shot in the face by some two-bit thugs. They killed him and they left him in the car to go to work with Safa and to show that anybody who worked with the British, I was attached to a British unit at the time, was gonna suffer the same fate. And they told Safa, they said, look, if you continue to work with these people, your family's gonna be murdered, not just in a year, tomorrow or next week or whenever we decide to come by. And that's a problem. That's a real difficulty for people that are out there and have to make a choice in life. You have to make a choice as to whether you're gonna connect with a different world a choice as to whether you're going to stand for something that's different, something that is uh, transcendent. And Safa did make a choice. He said, I have to uh, um, stand up for my family, my people, my future, and he came to work the next day. One of the bravest men that I've ever met. And so I'm here to say that he's not the only one that's out there. I think that where we, where we are today is Safa is a microcosm for connectedness, a microcosm for uh, oil and the effect that it has on nations and the world. And I spend time on this because I think this conclusion is at the basis of why anybody would be crazy enough to start a car company. It would be probably no surprise to anybody in this audience today that transportation uses 71% of all imported and domestic oil in the United States. It's nice to have an audience that probably understands that very well. And the fact that cars and light trucks use almost all of that should be no surprise. And it's probably also not a surprise that 60% of what we import is basically the amount that we use in cars. 60% of our oil is what we import, and that's basically what we use in cars. So if we could cut our usage in cars in half, then we could cut what we import in half. And that would solve a lot of problems. If we could fix this giant car predicament, we would be able to rejuvenate our children's environment. We would be able to uh, step forward and uh, get security from two-bit thugs, people who would shoot other people in the face. And we would be able to do things like grab energy independence. I don't need to spend a lot of time on it because it's something that's been covered by peers that are far more erudite than I am. I know how to build cars. Safa wasn't the only one that lost. I lost also. I carry the memory of two friends at a minimum who are very close to me who will never come home to see their sweethearts or their children again because they were fighting in a war in an oil-rich oil region that was torn by strife. So I never wanted to come home to my boys who are one, three, and five and tell them that I hadn't tried to do the most good in life. That's my story. And I wanted to have a little bit of fun while I was doing it. I was passionate about cars. And so I came back to this country and I said, I'm gonna make a difference. And I said, what are the tools that I have together to do it? This was my grandfather. I was a slumdog chaiwala to this man. I learned everything there was about passion and cars. This guy owned the Indian Motorcycle Company for 12 years. It was hugely successful and then a failure. He was the person that crowdsourced a cure for rheumatic fever and was told that it would be put him down in the grave. And he said, I can go out and raise money and make this happen. He wrote the first newsletter that I had ever seen in my life. This is him buying the Indian Motorcycle Company. This is the Rogers Roundup. 1940, he had a pure expense line on the line of his company that said, I'm going to connect with the world, make my employees, make my customers, 
and make my company famous across the world. But not only that, I'm going to ask for feedback. So they used to run quizzes in the Rogers Roundup. This is Newsletter 2.0. If you think we're doing Web 2.0 new or if you think you're blogging, this was a guy who sat quietly in the back of the room and spent money to make sure that he was connected on the front lines. He was the true Mr. Rogers, if you will. And he stoked my fire for cars and he gave me the curse. He gave me the curse, the curse of Preston Tucker, somebody who really wanted to do something for cars and said, damn the torpedoes, I'm going to make something happen. So I have a deep and undying love for cars. I have been in the recurring 12-step 12, 12 program since I was old enough to push a matchbox car. My name is Jay Rogers, and I love cars. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I have the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. <laughs> But I'll be damned if we go into the 21st century and not take cars with us. I am personally ashamed that we, the leader of the industrial and internet revolutions, have left milk toast cars as our legacy to yield the lowest average corporate fuel economy in the developed world. That is shameful. And I have a challenge. My challenge is that if we loved our cars, and if we were a little bit more intimate with them, that we would be able to rid ourselves of this disconnectedness of utilitarianism that's sort of taken over the field, and we may be able to make it to the other side of innovation. What I'm saying here, basically, is that cars have not come into the slow food revolution. Bobby Flay, Martha Stewart, Paula Deen, these people have done a lot for us. They've taken us into an era which is, you can do it, we can help. Lance Niebauer has taken a generation of airplane enthusiasts and said, you can drive in, build the plane, paint your Aztec warrior on the side, and then you can fly at home. It's an amazing thing. So we have cars as one of the great American pastimes. Read about Bill Buxton. He and I were just talking about the fact that he was inspired to get into the field that he is today because of his love for his brother's R69S 1971 boxer BMW motorcycle. Hoorah! <laughs> so I've come clean with some of my weaknesses. And I'd like to see some of yours. How many people here actually know how to fix something meaningful in their car today? Hands? <laughs> well, I guess it's, it's less than the 40% that's been to a previous Biff. <laughs> Automakers seem intent on keeping us out of the love for our cars. I mean, you can almost void the warranty in your car by opening up the hood and jump-starting the car in the wrong way, if the battery's even under the hood, for those of you that own a BMW. <laughs> so, but loving cars is not a credential for starting a car company. For that, I sort of went into the wilderness, and it was nothing like a grand plan. I worked in China for three years. I had very much of the same experience that many people have, that they've traveled. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen. I worked with diabetics. Uh, um, and so it was a good thing for me to learn and get out of cultures. Uh, I was an infantry marine. I was a sniper. Uh, I learned combat leadership on the front lines. And uh, I'm a chartered financial analyst, which is super boring. <laughs> at least for me. Um, and so I decided that I needed to make a choice, and I made a choice. I said, look, I'm going to start a car company, but I could do it two ways. I could either build a better mousetrap, I could build a better car, which would be really hard, and it costs a gazillion dollars to do it, and so you need to make a gazillion cars to justify sell it, spending that gazillion dollars. Or you could take a less obvious approach, which is to build a better process. A better process for connecting with customers, a better process for connecting with innovation, and bringing it into your uh, product, your end product, something that you sell to people. And, uh, and to consistently make better cars. So that's what I did. And what I knew were a few things. I knew that if I moved fast and I made rapid decision making in wartime that I'd be better off than moving slow. And I wanted to be nimble. But how can you be nimble when you have to tool big? And how can you avoid tooling big when you need to have cars on lots to sell? And how can you avoid having cars on lots to sell if you have angry and impulsive Americans that want to come and buy a car when they have a pre-cleared check that they can go out and buy one with? 